Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Mr. Jeffries, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. We're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects and probably a couple of others, but can you please introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Well, I'm Don Jeffries. I think that the JFK research community probably is aware of me. I've been uh, researching the JFK assassination since the mid-70s when I was a teenager with Mark Lane's uh, Citizens Committee of Inquiry. Uh, We helped the lobby Congress to try to get uh, what became the House Select Committee on Assassinations to reopen the investigation. We were very disillusioned about it, obviously, because I I don't think it was much of an investigation. But I never uh, left the subject, and I continued to to write about it, along with other things. And when I wrote my book, Hidden History, when that was published in 2014, the majority of uh, the book covers the JFK assassination, the RFK assassination. And I also launched the first investigation into what I think was the assassination of JFK Jr. Uh, So in Chappaquiddick, I covered all the Kennedy stuff along with everything else. So uh, I'm a little bit different maybe than most researchers because I don't limit myself just to that, but I uh, I have a lot of knowledge of the JFK assassination. It is my wheelhouse issue, as I told you, and uh, it, it remains kind of, I don't know if it's an obsession, but it's something certainly that I never lost interest in ever since uh, you know I first discovered it as, as a teenager. It's got me hooked for sure the past couple of months. I feel like I'm losing sleep over it. Um, I'm, I'm curious, when you talk about the HSCA, I've shown some documents to like Posner about the HSCA talking about Marina Oswald couldn't identify between a rifle and a shotgun. Well, the Warren Commission states that she pointed out Lee's rifle. When you said that like their attempts or their failed attempts, I guess, if it was an investigation, do you just explain a little bit about that? I know they had some trouble, but I'm curious if like where there's cherry picking of certain people on the committee for a particular reason or things of this sort that I've heard. Well, you're probably familiar with it. The committee started out, uh, I think, with good intentions. And Henry Gonzalez was the original cha- chairman of the committee. And I, Gonzalez has kind of his own unusual baggage, although he was certainly said a lot of the right things. He was the one who, uh, John Connolly's uh, suit and uh, shirt ended up in, in uh, his closet, in Henry Gonzalez's congressional office closet. Uh, and most people don't remember that. Very strange, was never explained. It was laundered, so the evidence, evidentiary value was gone. I think it's the way to destroy so many things, but why it ended up in Gonzalez's closet, I don't know. He was from Texas. He was a congressman from Texas, but uh, his record as a congressman was actually pretty good, so I don't know why he has that on his record. But once, once they established the committee, the press went into overdrive. Washington Post, especially my hometown newspaper, just went nuts attacking the, the idea of the committee nonstop. And, you know, the Washington Post typically doesn't uh, concern itself with government spending, but they were just going crazy how much money was being spent on this frivolous thing. And uh, they, uh, their original uh, lead counsel was a guy named uh, Richard A. Sprague, who was uh, a really good guy. And I think he was really, he had good intentions. And he talked about, hey, you know, we're going to be a no hold bards investigation. And he specifically said, you know, we're not going to leave out the CIA or anything like that. But uh Thanks to the press, uh, the manipulation of the coverage, and they somehow managed to set Sprague and uh, Gonzalez, who I think were both pretty good, uh, at each other's throats. And they kind of, I don't know, they leaked certain things to each one. So they thought they were, you know, they, they created one of these typical diversionary battles and ended up that Sprague uh, was forced to resign and that Gonzalez resigned. And so you got Lewis Stokes, who was kind of a go along to get along kind of guy. And uh, then you had Robert Blakey, who just changed the, complete course of the investigation and turned it into something way different than what Sprague intended. He had good intentions originally, but Blakey, from the very beginning, he made everybody sign a non-disclosure agreement and he taught he, their files were sealed for even longer than the Warren Commission's were. Warren Commission, they got a lot of flack, rightly so, that they were going to seal the records for 75 years or something. And uh, Blakey saw that they sealed the HSCA records, a lot of them for longer than that. He made people, again, to sign disclosure agreements with the CIA. He worked with the CIA instead of investigating them. So he, And now he's kind of turned around and said maybe uh, 
because of George Joannidis or something. Maybe I was lied to. I shouldn't have lived, but you know, I, I don't trust the guy. And uh, I wrote a lot about what they did in, uh, in Hidden History, and I'm uh, getting ready to publish Hidden History 3 soon, too, and I'll have a lot more about that. But other than a few good things, you had, uh, for instance, we found out, thanks to the HSCA, we found out that Seymour Weitzman, who's one of my favorite witnesses, uh, he was one of the two officers that discovered the rifle on the sixth floor of the, of the Texas School Book Depository, and they each independently signed the sworn affidavit identifying it as a completely different weapon, as a German Mauser. They were both mistaken in the exact same way. But uh, Weitzman was at the scene of a lot of things. He was the one seeing the phony Secret Service agents on the grassy knoll. He was in the middle of everything. And uh, he apparently, after the assassination, he didn't have a good go of it. Uh, researcher, the early researchers couldn't contact him. And later you found out why. They reported he, he was in a mental institution at the time at the HSCA. And they, uh, the investigators visited him and talked about his paranoia. And uh, later, when I was writing Hidden History, uh, he had no children. So I tried to track down his family. And I talked to a, a nephew who just screamed at me the entire time. I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing. This is, you know, 50, 50 some years later, and the fear is still there. And I did finally get in the middle. Look, this, can you tell me, was your uncle institutionalized? It, was it because of the JFK assassination? He said, yes. So uh, that's just, so that's one thing they did. Uh, there wasn't much else worthwhile, really, in the HSCA. Uh, and uh, I think it was Rod Rodriguez that originally was, did some good work on the Mexico City trip, alleged Mexico City trip of Oswald. But aside from that, it was a waste of time. And they were they backed every single one of the Warren Commission's absurd conclusions, including even the single bullet theory. Uh, and they were they were ready to go with that. But for whatever reason, uh, Officer McLean's uh, stuck microphone uh, came out right at the last minute with the acoustics evidence, which I've never thought was very good evidence. But uh, they, for whatever reason, they ended up issuing their conclusion that he was, it was, he was killed as a result of a probable conspiracy. But they didn't have a real investigation. If you look at their record, and we still can't even find, you know, writing Hidden History 3, trying to find a lot of their, you can find some of their testimony. But a lot of the people they talk to, we'll find in the record that they talk to somebody and you can't find their testimony anywhere, any record of it. So it's, it's frustrating trying to, uh, and that's why I think there's really never not been a full length book other than Gaetan Fonzi, who was, who was probably the, one of the few good people on the HSCA who wrote the last investigation, a good book. But other than that, uh, and he only had so much information in there, you can't really, uh, it hasn't been an expose of them like you had of all the exposés of the Warren Commission, Rush to Judgment by Lane, and Accessories After the Fact, Whitewash Series by Weisberg. Nothing like that because you, you just can't find enough records. When it comes to Weitzman being locked in a mental institution for paranoia or whatever he was being charged on, um, I'm just curious, is it like a Roger Craig incident where he had multiple attempts on his life and eventually he just started going mad because you're basically being paranoid because people are literally trying to kill you? I had not. I, I don't know that. I have not. And again, the only person I was able to talk to is his nephew. And if you read, it's in the records. It's a very short kind of document that describes seeing him and i think he i think he claimed some men came after him or something but other than that it's kind of vague and of course they weren't about to explore anything of that they and you know, most people would just attribute that oh, okay so, as they say about so many of these witnesses well they're just nuts you know they went crazy and so what they're saying is crazy i don't know that's the case and really again he has uh, he had a, a nephew that i talked to and just basically kept denying everything i wasn't he didn't get a really chance to question him uh, his wife is long gone and they didn't have kids. So it's kind of hard to, you know, he's kind of, he's kind of an enigmatic figure. That's why I, I've always been interested in him because uh, he, he was in all the hot spots and he ends up in a mental institution. So I think uh, whatever, there may be some answers there. I don't know, but I, I don't know that he had, uh, certainly not to the set of Roger Craig, that's very well documented. Yeah. You know, and uh, by my friend, Steve Cameron and uh, you know, Roger Craig Jr. I uh, I mean, the only one saving boat that gives us this idea of conspiracy, even though the HSCA talked about a probable conspiracy, but it's just that aspect of the Jack Ruby scenario. Why is a strip club owner shooting the alleged killer of the president? You know, that was questions everyone had on their mind. What the hell is going on? And the fact that someone in the middle of court brought that up, did anybody question if Jack Ruby was an FBI informant? just opens up that door enough for us to get into the conspiracy aspect. Cause I honestly don't think there would have been a proper investigation, even if we would have assigned one today. I think Oswald would have been, if he would have made it to a court appointment or anything would have been trial by media. The media was all in line with making him burn on the stake. And that becomes an issue. I started looking at life magazine. Like 
what power do you have? I think of them like a, one of those nature magazines that has a pretty butterfly on the front. I don't really, I guess, cause maybe my age, I don't see the power that they must've had. And then when I looked into it, I was like, was this a shell company? Like, was this something in line with the government or some type of manipulation thing? Like we know about the radical observer, which was put on campuses and it was an FBI magazine basically to go against activists during the Vietnam war. So I don't throw it out of the realm of possibility. Sure. Well, you had you already had Mockingbird Media had already started. You had lots of assets in the media. Uh, you had uh, C.D. Jackson was the, the head of uh, Time Life magazine, had his curious connections. And uh, it was just Life magazine that hadn't merged with Time yet. But uh, just all you need to know about them is that uh, for that for that particular outlet, Life magazine, is that they purchased the Zapruder film. Later, we found out they paid a lot more than was reported and uh, they bought it to bury it. Very curious thing for a free press to do. You think, like, man, we got the film. You know, we, this is competition, right? We have a competitive media. No, they buried it until uh, 1975 when Harold Rivera, of all people, you know, thanks to Robert Grodin and Dick Gregory, uh, played it on uh, his show, Good Night America. But people, and I had seen a bootleg copy before that, but uh, and they were out there. But um, that's a very curious thing for a media to do. But I mean, all you need to know about that, and again, I talked about this in, in history, but not a single not a single mainstream reporter at the time, all the big names, Tom Wicker, a very young Dan Rather, who got uh, really rose to fame based on he was a local CBS Dallas reporter. And he happened to be on the scene. Of course, he just lied repeatedly and he talked about seeing the Zapruder film and breathlessly how JFK's head went forward. And of course, later when we saw the film, we realized how he lied about that. But um, so you had these, not a single, not a single mainstream media figure except Dorothy Kilgallen was probably the most famous woman in America at that time. She was researching. She got the, the only private interview with Jack Ruby before he died. And uh, she was obviously, I think, obviously killed. There's no question about it. And uh, then her uh, <coughs> her best friend, Edie Smith, who was a uh, Florence Smith, who was uh, a former lover of JFK, ironically, and that was her best friend. And she died two days after her, very young age. So these are the kind of things when people say there are no mysterious deaths, they're everywhere. And, you know, a lot of a lot of the even so-called pro-conspiracy people now poo-poo it. My work is littered with them, and lots of them have been forgotten. For instance, that Kilgallen and her friend Roselli. Her are- Roselli. Well, certainly later Roselli. You know, certainly remember Roselli and Giancana, who both died along with you know George D. Moore and Shield and tons of others. That was like the second wave of deaths in '76 and '77. That all these people that were scheduled to testify before the HSCA. And so many of them, you know, died unnaturally before that. But so, uh, and at the time of the assassination, we never, the media rolled over and played dead at the very beginning, from the very beginning. They never questioned the official story. And all you need to know about, I published this in Hidden History, NBC agreed, I think it was a day after the assassination, agreed, and it's in writing out there, only to broadcast information that was in, they use this word, in consonance with the FBI report. So they agreed in writing that they wouldn't question the official narrative a day after the assassination. So if you wonder why you were watching these things, Walter Cronkite was weeping on air, but they weren't asking the questions they should have asked. Um, That's all you need to know. I mean, the media media really was no different then. It's just, it wasn't as obvious because there were only three networks. And even at that time, they they played the emotions, you know, as a a seven-year-old kid watching it, uh, it's one of my earliest memories uh, because the, uh, the, the long dragged out funeral procession of Jackie Kennedy holding the hands of the kids, John John saluting, all that stuff. That was ingrained in the public's mind and, and the public was distracted by that emotion. And JFK became martyred for a, a brief period, but nobody asked the questions they should have. And you're right, after Ruby, I mean, I heard that as a seven-year-old kid, none of my large Catholic family, they all, there's nobody that believed Oswald did it. And it was primarily was triggered when when Oswald was shot by this this nightclub owner with obvious mob connections. And, uh, you know, I remember as a seven-year-old kid going around telling people, oh, shut, he, obviously Ruby shot Oswald to shut him up. I mean, my seven-year-old mind can comprehend that. And, uh, but apparently uh, none of the best and the brightest and the, uh, the glitterati and uh, the people in the, the, the universities, apparently none of them, it, it made sense to them somehow that Ruby would do it. And again, we know, <clears throat> we know for instance, that uh, Ruby was stalking Oswald. We know their photographs of him all, their video of him all weekend. There's video of a press conference at, at the, where he corrects Henry Wade. He said, where is he, Henry Wade says the 
something in hands off Cuba committee or something. And, and he says, no, Henry, it's fair play for, for Cuba committee. So, I mean, it couldn't be more obvious that he was there. You had, uh, <clears throat> you had people like Seth Cantor, respected reporter who saw Oswald, I mean, saw a movie at Parkland Hospital watching Oswald. And uh, you had Mrs. Wilma Tyson. Again, I go over her testimony, some of the most impressive testimony that I found in the Warren Commission that shows what kind of investigation was launched, where she describes getting threatening phone calls. She describes, and, and just watch how that testimony sets out, and it's, it's, a, it's a template for the way the Warren Commission operated. She, the, the commission, the, I think it was, uh, oh God, I think it was Burt Griffin. I can't remember which commission, but they all acted the same, all the councils, our young Earl inspector, whatever. But they basically, and you can see, I quote the testimony in Hidden History, where he asked her about, I don't know, half a dozen times, are you sure you want to testify? Think carefully about it. Do you really want to appear here? Would you rather not testify? I mean, it's unbelievable. And, you know, so, so, well, yeah, I, I want to. And then, of course, the commission said, because she described seeing Jack Ruby, she knew him very well at Parkland Hospital, but the commission decided that she was mistaken. And uh, so was Seth Cantor. And the commission didn't care that Wilma Tice was getting threatening phone calls or, uh, again, you have to read the, com the testimony to see, but the, uh, the Warren Commission, and that's why I have no patience anymore of anybody that even entertains it for a minute, because as a teenager, it took me less than a week, I think, of just reading through the hearings and exhibits, because I actually went to my library and checked them out, uh, and, and reading the, the first few critical works on it. It took me like less than a week to realize, wow, I, I mean, I don't know who killed him, but it certainly wasn't the Harvey Oswald. I mean, the, the official so-called investigation destroys the official story by itself. I always bring up the example that if we talk about the backyard photographs, which people use as best evidence against Oswald saying, oh, that's how you know he did it. Look, he's got all three things to incriminate himself. First of all, that's the weirdest photo I've ever seen of holding all three things that could incriminate you later. Second of all, if I see a picture of you with a beer in your hand, do I immediately assume you drove home? Like there's there's that kind of thing that doesn't really it doesn't work in court. And I. I it's just, it's confusing. I mean, what was the most, I guess, surprising thing for you during all your assassination research? Like I particularly probably focused more and a little bit of Oswald, but more about the Jack Ruby MK ultra angle on things, um, which a lot of people just don't even bother to touch. Cause that becomes a huge mess, um, with a lot of documents that we're probably never going to have cause they were destroyed with MK ultra. But I'm just curious, what was the most surprising thing for you? Boy, that's hard to say. I mean, the entire process was uh, you know, very uh, surprising. Certainly, the single bullet, the magic bullet, the, the weaving, and how how many how what it's zigzagging and the angles don't work, and and of course how it came out in pristine condition almost. Uh, and I, you know, as a, as a teenager again, I got to because of my uh, position as the co-chair of a, a chapter in Falls Church, Virginia, of Mark Lane's group. You know, the, the another teenager, uh, I got to go to the National Archives and. Um, with my little researcher card and I got to spend all day there and I got to help hold the, the magic bullet in my hand and I got to hold the ridiculous Carcano rifle. I got to the clothes, they brought uh, JFK's uh, suit and shirt out to me so you could see where the bullet holes were and you know, it just about exactly, it's five and a half, six inches down. It's pretty much exactly where uh, uh, Boswell uh, noted, noted them as being on the original autopsy face sheet by mistake and where Admiral Berkeley described them on the death certificate and where uh, FBI agent Siebert O'Neill described them. So that, that alone, the bullet, the, the bullet wound in the back alone just proves the official story because it's about five and a half inches below uh, the neckline. And uh, they're telling you that Oswald was six stories above. So how, how in the world does a, a bullet enter five and a half inches on a back without deflecting a bone and exit the throat. It's absolutely impossible. And even, even to, that's, you leave out the zigzagging and all that. And then of course you had the condition of the bullet. And when you see the bullet, and it took me years actually to become sophisticated enough. And uh, Vincent Solandria was very instrumental in that. One of, the, one of the great underrated critics who just died last year, like 90 something years old. But uh, he wrote early on and had great influence on my thinking. Because I was thinking the same thing is that, you know, they, that the conspirators, whoever they were, wanted people to know there was a conspiracy and i think the single bullet is the most obvious example of that because i it took me a long time to say you know if it, these were sophisticated conspirators and i think they were i think they were you know they were at the working at the behest of very high level powerful forces if you're planning a bullet why would you plan a bullet that looked like it hit something 
Why would you plant a bullet that the critics would instantly say, hey, you know, this is, look, your own test, you can look at the Warren Commission volumes and the same ammunition for the Carcano, they test fired into uh, the, the wrist of a, 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 a human wrist, uh, a goat carcass. And you can see how smashed up all the bullets are. And then you look at the one they fired into cotton whiting and it looks exactly the same. So they're letting you know, again, in their own investigation here, these, this bullet couldn't have done it. But it's buried in the exhibits, and that's what you know. Critics like Sylvia Marr and Mark Lane and Herb Weisberg that poured through these things early on, because no 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 mainstream reporter did, except for Dorothy Kilgallen, who was killed. Uh, no other reporter looked at these things. None of them. They had no interest in the evidence. They just read the Warren report, which was a and that was the, the great thing about the. And I think that was probably overall the most thing that most amazed me: reading these critical works and then and and going to the hearings and exhibits and seeing how. And that's all Sylvia Marr did and, and Mark Lane, Harold Weisberg, these guys, they looked at the 26 volumes and they would say in the 888 page, pretty much meaningless press release that was the Warren report, it's full of junk, like, you know, pictures of Oswald's pubic hair, really. Is that really in there? Is that really in yes. there? Yes. Yes, it is absolutely in there. Jesus. And, uh, and, and uh, things like uh, Jack Ruby's mother's dental charts. I know that and, as, <laughs> as, as, and Mark Lane said at the time, that wouldn't be relevant that Jack Ruby had bit Oswald to death. I mean, it makes no sense, but that's what the that's what's in the record. Meaningless testimony. Uh, this, people like uh, Viola Peterman and people, people that, that never had met Lee Harvey Oswald, but babysat the infant Oswald, or in the case of uh, another woman, had known the Oswalds before Oswald was born. And they're testifying and their testimony goes on for pages. And if you if you watch, you can see, and, and uh, Kevin Costner as Jim Garrison talked about that. I could really relate to him. He says, ask the question, ask the question. And, and he's, he's talking about watching the record being padded and watching this stuff go on and on. Where did you go to school? What did your parents do? You know, it completely irrelevant nonsense. And it's to pad the record. And then they don't even ask, you know, where did the shots come from half the time? So um, this, I think, was the most important thing is that you you look at, uh, they would, uh, and Sylvia Marin was especially good at that, where she would say, okay, this is what, the, this is the conclusion of the Warren Commission. They'll say whatever the conclusion was. And this is their source note for it. And, you know, as I'm very scrupulous about it in my, I have hundreds and hundreds of, you know, and footnotes in all my work, because I don't trust people that don't footnote their work. And so it, it would go to, uh, you know, a particular document or a particular page of a hearings and exhibits. And when the critics examined that page, they would discover almost all the time that the conclusion was either completely contradicted by the evidence, it said the exact opposite thing, or sometimes it was completely irrelevant. It had nothing to do with what they were saying. So that was the beauty. And that's why the public, I think, took to those books so well and made, you know, Art Rush to Judgment was a bestseller. Uh, because they were doing the work, this this is something the professional journalists should have been doing, and they weren't. Instead, they took the time. You had somebody like Anthony Lewis, this horrific reporter for the New York Times. The New York Times is really especially bad on this, and uh, they did nothing but attack the critics. And he uh, and this uh, he uh, actually published a, scurl, a book called uh, "The Critics and Scavengers of the Warren Report," and I've read it. I think I have it somewhere, but it's uh, it's just unbelievable to, to watch it and think this is journalism. The entire thing was to you know attack Harold Weisberg for being a chicken farmer and uh, Penn what? Jones. I use his archive all the time. Of course, he was incredible. But the the entire thing was to attack the early critics. They attacked Shirley Martin, who should is not mentioned by the research community, and she was one of the most important early critics. Housewife, she never wrote a book. Her daughter later died in a mysterious car accident again, unnatural deaths, and that kind of she ended up, she stopped doing research. I, I, you know, I guess, and I can understand that, but uh, she doesn't get her due. And a lot of the early critics uh, relied on her. And one person in Hidden History 3, I'll write a lot about it. One person who I think has been treated unfairly is Marguerite Oswald, Oswald's mother. She was the first so-called conspiracy theorist. And you can look at the record. She's the one that first raised the picture about the backyard photos. She's the first one that talked about Oswald being in the doorway in the Altkins photograph. She used to tell Jim Mars for years that, no, that's my son. I know my son. And uh, she was she raised a lot of this stuff, said my son was you know, a government agent. It came from her. And of course, she hired Mark Lane to be the uh, her to represent her son's her dead son's interests before the Warren Commission. So uh, a lot of these people get forgotten. And I got, I got uh, they, two major questions. Sure. One, why did Mark Lane or why did Margaret fire Mark Lane? Why did that happen? Well, you know, 
she did have, and Marguerite had a, a, a obviously contentious personality, I think. And uh, I'm not sure what really happened there. You know, I, I don't think we can really tell. And uh, I, I, I wouldn't defend her personality. It seems like she was pretty cantankerous. But I go into how she was demonized, and she really was. I mean, for instance, they, uh, and a lot of it comes from Bob Schieffer, who, again, is one of these awful putrid, I think he's still alive, uh, putrid so-called journalist who never has broken and never done investigative work in his entire career, unless it was to, to smear a whistleblower or something. But uh, Schieffer made a big deal out of uh, riding Marguerite uh, to the uh, police station or something that day because she needed a ride. Now, why Marguerite called his newspaper, I have no idea. It made, that made no sense. That's why I kind of doubt a lot of the story because it makes no sense to me. But he is the one who built in the public's mind the impression of Marguerite Oswald as this horrible woman who just complained all the time and was so cheap and everything and was looking for money. And it was totally unfair because Marguerite Oswald, after the assassination, immediately was fired. Uh, you know, nobody wanted to, you know, say, I want well, Lee Harvey Oswald's mother works for me. She couldn't get a job anywhere else. She, she was the only one crying in half of the damn photos with Ruth Payne and Marina. She's sitting there holding a tissue up to her nose. Yes, yes, she was. And she, uh, so, and, and again, I'm aware, I, I, I'm, uh, John Armstrong's my friend. I've read Harvey and Lee. And there's, there is compelling evidence, you know, he, he, that, that there were two Marguerites as well as two Har uh, Lee. I don't know what that means, but... And I don't know what it means for this woman, who would have been an imposter under his theory. But all I know is whoever she was, I think she was treated uh, unfairly. And the whole idea of her being cheap and selling autographs and selling memorabilia, that's the only way she had to move to, to make money. She had to survive. She was, she was living on a Social Security pittance, and she was uh, already elderly. So, I mean, what was she supposed to do? So, I think it's terribly unfair. And uh, so, but I, I have all the like the lines from Schieffer and everybody else and she continues to be smeared actually and I don't, I don't want this to be about her but um, I just think she she uh, did contribute a lot more to the research community than they say but see and the research community as a whole uh, ha has never supported me for instance uh, hidden, hidden history probably has probably sold more copies than I, I want to say almost any book on the JFK that had touches on the JFK assassination in the last few decades and it's been almost completely ignored by the research community. And um, a lot of that has to be with, you know, we, we find that again, I, if you go on these forums and you encounter people, you'll find that it, it, this subject does draw difficult personalities and huge egos. I can't spend five minutes on there before someone drops their fucking link that completely trashes the link I just did. And I was like, oh, fuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that's the, the problem. Is it, it is. And so many of these people have never done anything, never published anything. I don't know what they call themselves researchers. I'm not sure what they're researching. Somebody has but, to uh, get laid at some point because everyone spends way too much damn time on yeah. there. I'm like, don't you guys have a job or something? Well, there, there are a lot of incels in the community. And yeah, that, that runs through, again, because I, I go, I'm in the conspiracy world. So you the 9-11 community is very similar to that, probably even worse, uh, where you have tons and tons of really strange. And, and what Mark Lane said, and I think this, this goes for 9-11 or anything else, is that because we have a media that doesn't do its job, they're supposed to investigate things. They, they're paid a lot of money to do this. So, But it's just turned into a thing where everybody, if you don't agree with it, it's fake news. But because they don't, Mark Lane said in the original introduction to Russia Judgment, he said, because this crime was never investigated, and it never was. The JFK assassination to say has still never been honestly investigated by any authoritative body. And you have citizens that tried their best, but you know we don't have subpoena power. We, we can I, I can tell you how hard it is to get a hold of most witnesses, and they end up a lot of times just you know ye yelling at you like Seymour Weitzman's nephew did to me, people like that, and they're scared clearly. But if media had tried to do their job from the very beginning, it'd be a completely different story. And Mark Lane said because they didn't. They have cre they're creating fertile grounds for speculation. Now that applies to the entire conspiracy world because these these things, these crimes, and these incidents are not honestly investigated. They create fertile ground for speculation. So you have people coming up with you know there there's still people that believe JFK wasn't even assassinated. I I, I talk to them all the time, and it's like I said, okay, you know I'm willing to consider just about anything. But there had, and that, that's what you get. And you get people, now you have a whole uh, group that believes that um, this prayer man theory, where everybody believes there's a very shadowy figure in the doorway. I'd love for that to be Oswald. 
but you can't tell anything about it. It's like Badge Man on the null. It's it's little pixels, and you see what you want into it because we can't we can't possibly make it clear enough to see what it was. So, but these people pretty much base their entire belief around oh, that's that's Oswald. Well, again, I'd love it to be Oswald. I don't know. You have other people who think it's a woman. It can look like it's like a, a Rorschach test. It's it's what you want to see in it. And uh, I still, you know, I haven't rejected the fact I, the Altskins photograph the doorway is a lot clearer. And I'm one of the people. And this is why I I get run into uh, disputes with so many of them because I, I I don't think it's been proven that that is definitely a Billy Lovelady. It might be, but I don't think. And again, Lee Harvey Oswald's mother, to her dying day, believed it was him. So I think that, again, you can't base evidence on something like that, because, again, even that photograph much clearer, you can't tell. But the evidence that they should be stressing, and they don't stress it. Instead, they talk about George Joannides and David Atlee Phillips and all that stuff. And that's fine. We can't really, it's hard to prove exact names. All we should stress, and I tried, if you go back, you can search and see uh, the results I got on the education form, which is the biggest form uh, out there, Spartacus. and. Um, I tried to write years ago, probably been a decade or so, a consensus statement. And I said, can we have a consensus statement, very short and to the point, that we can rally around? Like all the lone nutters, you don't see the lone nutters fighting with each other at all. I mean, they rally around the cause of, hey, they got it right. Oswald did it, period. Ends of story. They're no theorizing. They're nothing. But all the people that doubt that. They all have their pet theories and they want, they argue over the, uh, how many angels are dancing on the head of a pin. And I just tried to, to get them to rally around. I, I forget what it was exactly, but people can, can go there and, and, uh, and find it, you know, the education form in the archives. But it, it's something around, you know, uh, the, the, the JFK assassination was never, has never been properly investigated by any uh, government body. And that uh, the evidence shows overwhelmingly that whoever killed JFK, it wasn't the Harvey Oswald. The official story is wrong. Something like that. I can't remember how I worded it, but and, and you should just see the answers I got. I mean, they, people would quibble with one word or something, and that's the problem. Is that you can't rally around. We we should all be rallying around the fact that they lied to us. It wasn't Oswald. They lied to you, and uh, then you can figure out it was the CIA, it was this and that. You know, I don't know. That's why people ask me all the time who killed JFK. I said, I, I, I mean, I can you know I certainly have my own hunches. But I'm not going to say for sure that I know, because all I, because it's never been investigated, and you can't. It's hard to prove those things because you're not going to find a memo and all the releases that are still there. You're never going to find a document out of the CIA anywhere else that, that says, "Okay, here's how we're going to kill John F. Kennedy," and this, you know, and they're delineating who's doing what. They're they're not going to leave something like that in the public. But you can you can obviously look and see who uh, you know people talk about. Uh, you know, I, I, I have named a couple of people I think had to have been conspirators. One of them, I think, is McGeorge Bundy, who was the National Security Advisor, uh, JFK's Henry Kissinger, basically. Uh, this guy uh, wrote National Security Action Memorandum 273, which was written, it was drafted on November 22, 1963. And, uh, and Oliver Stone made a lot out of the NC, NSAM 263, which had been written like the month before, which was delineated how we were going to begin the withdrawal process from Vietnam. Very clear. First 1,000 troops out by the end of 1963. There weren't really any combat troops. First 1,000 people out by the end of 63. All troops out by 1965. So we were completely disengaging there. It was obvious, and it was, you know, people say it's a theory. No, it's not a theory. It was a national security action memorandum from JFK. And, uh, but, uh, so with George Bundy writing this new one to contradict it, completely flipped it on its head. And Lyndon Johnson couldn't wait to sign it as soon as he became president. And it paved the way for escalation. He had to have known that there was no way John F. Kennedy would have ever signed that and would have fired him on the spot for writing it. So I think it's obvious. And George Bundy also, just to add to that, he was in Washington, D.C., in the White House Situation Room on the day of the assassination. And he contacted uh, JFK's cabinet, which were all curiously in the air at the time. They were flying to a conference in Hawaii. And he notified them the afternoon, I, I think, you know, right after Oswald had been arrested, that certainly no news had come out about Oswald. There had been no investigation at all, none. And he assured everybody in the cabinet that there was no conspiracy and they had the right man. So you want to look at a suspect? I think McGeorge Bundy knew 
I, I, you know, they can try to sue me, I guess. I can't, again, I can't prove it, but I think those two pieces of evidence are pretty damning. And I think the Secret Service, clearly, they didn't do their job. And a lot of the critics won't look there. Emery Roberts was in charge of the detail that day. Um, there's evidence that he he stopped one of the um, one of the people uh, on, on the uh, follow-up car, John Reddy, who tried to jump and do his job, and he ordered him back. <clears throat> and you can also see him waving off a guy who I think was Henry Ripka, Vince Palarama, my friend, uh, disagrees with me. He thinks it uh, was Don Watton. I think it was Henry Ripka, and I, I was the first one ever to, uh, with the thanks to my friend William Law, who I hope you talk to William Law. He's the uh, most underrated guy on the uh, – Talk to William and Vince. Oh, good. Okay, great. Well, Vince is great, and uh, – William was able to get a hold. I talked to uh, Ripka's, uh, because Henry Ripka died early. And he, if you've seen the video that Vince unearthed of him shrugging his shoulders, you know, at at the airport where he's being waved off because he's, he's wanting to jog alongside the limousine, like the agents did in most every motorcade. And you can see he doesn't know what's going on. Um, I think it was Ripka and his family, their reaction, if people can read it in hidden history three, what his son, uh, his reaction when William Law contacted him, uh, very telling. And I I think uh, clearly it was it. But so I I think, you know, Secret Service, in a real investigation, the first thing they would have done is grill the Secret Service. The first thing a real press would have done is focus on the Secret Service and the fact that they did as, you know, as uh, someone should have got fired. Yeah. And I mean, nobody instead they were made heroes. Clint Hill today, still alive, is selling lots of books. And uh, is still making. He was so he was so distraught over it. He couldn't talk for the first few decades. Now he can't stop talking about it. And he's contradicting everything everything he ever said or wrote. And uh, these people again should have been. They should be ashamed to do it because they let it happen without this. I mean, they were as as um, as uh, Senator. Uh, oh God, what's his name? Yeah, it was. I can't believe I'm drawing a blank there. The guy was with Connolly. Connolly's enemy. Um, <laughs> getting old uh as he said you know a secret service agent and he wrote criticism afterwards uh, that uh, you know that a man can run 50 yards in a certain amount of time or something you had six seconds or so at least and uh you can see how close the follow-up car was uh there's if they had at the sound of gunfire if clint hill had reacted faster or john reddy had been allowed to go and uh, emory roberts hadn't waved him off or any of these agents had done their job and run up and or if um Merely uh, the uh, Kellerman, if Roy Kellerman in front, if he had merely done his job and jumped from into the back seat and covered JFK as uh, Rufus Youngblood did with J- with LBJ, they and of course William Greer would have been probably the first one you questioned. What are you doing? I mean, the evidence shows. You can see the brake lights come on. You had uh, fifty seven witnesses. As Vince Pellerano wrote an article about that, fifty seven witnesses that said the motorcade stopped or nearly stopped. These are, these are damning indictments of the Secret Service, and yet a lot of the critics won't even touch them. So instead of talking about some CIA station agent, I'm going to first concentrate on the Secret Service. They let it happen. And you figure out why did they let it happen? Why were they out drinking the night before? And version of it? you know why? And they covered that up as well. There there has so I think that a lot of the even the critics look in the wrong direction. That's why I think Vince's work has been so great. Because he's concentrated and he, he's one of the critics out there that I really appreciate his work. And I talk him up all I can. And William has done some, William Law's done great work on the uh, medical evidence. Again, it doesn't get the, the due that he deserves. He's a great he's guy, done, William Law. Yeah, yeah I, he is, I, and he's I, done great. I've mentioned multiple times when it comes to the Secret Service aspect of things. The one thing that I think is the most damning that people will not touch because they believe it deflames Kennedy's character which I do talk about the affairs. I talk about Johnson pissing on Secret Service member shoes. I talk about him walking around naked and him him getting called bull balls. I go, if you're protecting this man, you're not going to want to protect him when you don't agree with all the things that they're doing. And I think with the fair aspect of things on both Kennedy and Johnson, I think it doesn't matter. It's not deflaming the person's character. But in those guys' minds, they were talking about shooting Kennedy with a high-powered rifle if they were going to assassinate the man. Abraham Bolden has an account of that. You know, you get to this aspect of like, okay, so now your protection is necessarily talking about this. You shouldn't have them as protection. And whether the bubble top could have deflamed someone from maybe the idea of taking a shot, even though it wasn't bulletproof, I think there were measures in place that were not obviously put in there. Nobody should have published on November 19th that 
the motorcade was going by the book depository building, but they did first time ever in history and never happened again. And there's just a bunch of stuff where I go, someone has to lose their job. And the whole thing, I think what should happen is when we get all the documents released, finally, whenever that day is, I think a new history should have been be written on all the information that has came out after the Warren Commission. The Warren Commission accepted things without any prior pushing or anything on that. Marina saying she identified Lee's rifle. Then you got Jack Ruby's lawyer that made up a lie saying his heart goes out for Jackie Kennedy. That was a fabrication. Tom O'Neill exposed that. And you just get into all this area of stuff and go, the Warren Commission, I think with the report, the whole point was the public will read this. This will be the one that everyone reads. And then the people that generally care, you know, they'll read the volumes. And But Alan Dulles is saying that, quote, I don't think the public will read it anyway, print it all. I mean, people did read. And I think if you read the volumes, they don't add up to what the Warren Report says. And I, I don't think they're necessarily lying, but it's kind of like I found an article about um, a woman from a research review board that stated saying to the CIA – Hey, do you guys have a document on Lee Harvey Oswald that can interview? I talked to an agent named Demenslia, and he says that you guys interviewed a guy who worked at a radio factory in Minsk. And they go, we don't have a debrief on Oswald. Agent Demenslia says, that was a debrief. I know what a debrief is, and I did a debrief. They go, oh, we didn't classify this as a debrief, but here's his interview. What the f – so you're not lying. You just are very, very vague, and it's like filing from a Freedom of Information Act request. You'll get a Freedom of Information Act request if you can get the exact dates, the time, the month, the year, the middle name, all that type of stuff. But it has to be exact, or they'll just send you back. We couldn't find anything on this week or that week. you got to be more specific. Yeah, I mean, there's the, – the, the, again, the, the, the evidentiary record is littered with stuff like that. And by the way, it's Ralph Yarbrough, the senator. I, I can't believe I, I, I drew a blank on that that talked about that. It was very critical of the Secret Service uh, in, in the wake of the assassination because he witnessed it all firsthand. But, um, yeah, I think that, you know, and if we look at – and I think a lot of the people in the research community don't want to look at the JFK assassination in, in a larger context. And that's why I write about hidden history all the time. And I, I talk about, you know, this is – it, the way the press responded to the JFK assassination was really pretty much the way they respond to everything, every big thing like that. They they go into cover up mode. They don't investigate anything. You know, as, as a teenager, I was uh, you know I was influenced by Woodward and Bernstein. You know, that's what I wanted to be, and that was very disillusioning as a liberal Democrat to realize, wow, wait a minute, this is the only time they've that the press has ever done this. Why did they act that way during Watergate? And they didn't for anything else. Because, you know, that's what we were doing as, as, as teenagers for Mark Lane. Uh, I was trying to contact these local media that were so excited about Watergate. And you know, I hated Nixon, you know, all this stuff. And I thought, well, they're going to be they must not know about the, this big cover up with the Warren Commission. And I, you know, I'm i naive enough to think somehow I read these books and saw it, but they don't know. They have no. And of course, it, it was it was really, really shattering to my young uh, ego to realize that there's nothing I could say to them. They had no interest at all. Zero. And they still don't. I can't. There was not a single reporter. I remember the, the guy that was in the uh, uh, the uh, CCI with me uh, talked to Ike Pappas, who's a big reporter for us. And he was there. He covered Oswald's murder. And he he couldn't have been. He was so arrogant and full of himself when he was talking to this guy, this kid, uh, just basically above it all, condescending and thinking and when we know. And again, this is what's so hard when you when I watch C-SPAN and I see some professor talking to a group of impressionable college students and just saying, you know, Gerald Posner's work, Bluyosi's work, that's that's the book I'd go to. You know, and it just is just spouting out nonstop disinformation or lies. And there's nobody there. There's not a Don Jeffries or anybody else on the stage that's allowed to say, wait a minute, you know, this, everything you're saying is wrong, everything. And because the college kids are absorbing it in. And that's why, uh, some people have pointed out, you know, the public opinion polls on the on the assassination for, for from the beginning were uh, more people believe there was a conspiracy than not. And I think it got up to 89 percent or something at one point. My friend Richard Belzer, you know, uh, it came up with a great line, you know, 80, 89, you know, 90 percent of the American people think there was a conspiracy and the other 10 percent work for the government and the media. He's pretty accurate. I know. You know he wrote, and, he wrote and, a but, book about the witnesses deaths that I wanted to hear about. Yeah. Yeah. With my friend David Wayne and uh, he. He, uh, you know, very courageous to be that way in the entertainment industry. Because not many people are speaking out about that. But um, so when you when you have that those those nonstop lies that are being told, what happens is then you get what we have like a whole conspiracy industry now, 
because uh, there is no, that's why you mentioned flat earth and things like that. Uh, people are questioning the nature of everything. There, there's a lot of people that believe we're in a simulated reality. You know, the, the movie, The Matrix had a great deal to do with that too. So you hit red pill, black pill, people throw those terms around all the time because they realize they've been lied to about everything. And I think it's, it didn't start with the Kennedy assassination, but I think the awareness of it, that's why I started Hidden History with the JFK assassination, because I think you can look at uh, uh, the way uh, on November 22nd, 1963, I think a strong argument can be made that America was at its peak economically, culturally, the way we were seen by the rest of the world in terms of respect. I think that if you looked at a graph, we were up here. And then ever since then, it's been a steady line down since that day. And uh, I think because we didn't, they didn't tell us the truth about that. I think all the other lies followed. I, I, for instance, RFK, I said, you know, RFK would have never been assassinated if JFK hadn't have been. I don't think Chappaquiddick would happen. I write critically about that. I don't think Teddy was in the car. I think it was his political assassination. Again, I've just studied these things. JFK Jr., I did the first uh, you know, investigation of that. I found out that behind the scenes, I talked to people from his high school and his adult inner circle. Behind the scenes, JFK Jr. was obsessed with his father's assassination. He had been re he read all the books I read. And this was what he was saying. He was the only Kennedy that wasn't until RFK Jr. came along, but JFK Jr. really was. And again, if you study that, you'll see it's the same, a lot of the same questions in all these other cases. So just on, on those lines along, the family things, those, those are tied to that. So so many crimes had to happen because of the original crime. And uh, so this is why we are at the point we are today where you have so many people that don't believe anything. And anything that happens, it's it's fake news. You're lying or whatever. It's because we realize there is no, there's no mainstream media that we can trust or have ever been able to trust because they, I mean, that's why if, if you're lying about something like that, I always use that as a litmus test. Some Somebody may be saying some good things about it to me in my, in my mind for something else. But if they say Oswald did it, I say, okay, well, you've discredited yourself. Because at the very least, at best, you haven't bothered to do any investigation or look and look at the evidence there at all, and you're just parroting what you hear. But at worst, you're you're parroting known disinformation. My favorite in that would be uh, uh, Bill uh, Bill O'Reilly, who uh, did some good work early on, and and knew there was a conspiracy. I remember listening to an interview with him on the radio. I said, "Oh yeah, there's a conspiracy." And then he gets on Fox News. And he parrots disinformation to such an extent, I'll have the whole story in Hidden History 3, where he injected himself into the death of George Jermorenshield and completely lied about it. I mean, absolutely made up this incredible fantasy. I'm he was nowhere familiar. near. I'm not familiar with Jermorenshield's death. Yeah, well, Jermorenshield was, was uh, clearly, I think he was murdered. But uh, after being visited by Edward J. Epstein, last person to interview him, who was another suspect guy, you know, who wrote Legend, and I think, you know, <laughs> I think he's the epitome of Mockingbird Media. Uh, he was the last one that was there. And, uh, but O'Reilly kept made up this incredible fantasy about uh, going to visit him and, and, and knocking on the door and hearing the gunshot or something, which is complete nonsense because he was nowhere near Florida at the time. And uh, uh, what's uh, Gaetan, Gaetan Fonzi, who was friends with O'Reilly, his, his wife recorded a message from O'Reilly that day saying, hey, what's going on? I hear this guy uh, killed himself tomorrow. And so why didn't you let me know anything about it? He's, he's calling from, uh, I think he was in Texas where he worked. But he continued to parrot the lie that oh, I was there, you know, I was not knocking on the door and I heard the gunshot. Didn't, and it didn't discredit him at all. At all. So, I mean, and that's just one guy. I mean, there's so many people that are involved. Dan Rather, obviously, his entire career has been built on that. He climbed the ladder of success until he became Walter Cronkite's successor because of the way he misrepresented the truth because he was one of the field reporters. And at CBS at the time was probably the biggest of the three networks. I think Walter Cronkite probably had the, the highest ratings of the three. And so he was getting all his field reports from Dan Rather. So Dan Rather made a name for himself then. So <clears throat> this is well, you had Dorothy Kilgallen behind the scenes writing a book and was very famous. And that, that who knows what would have happened if she had been it, because that might have opened the door a little bit to Hollywood in those days, because she was also a regular panelist on What's My Line, a very popular show. So she, she you know, because she died, I, I, you know, we, we're not, we don't know, maybe the, co the coverage would have been different. I don't know. 
there was a, you know one of one of the many strange guests the guests also was another reporter Jim Cody who uh, was killed <laughs> again uh, by a karate chop to the throat as he exited his shower and that's that's exactly the oh, official shit. cause of death I've heard and, that uh, one Penn Jones talked about it and, yeah and and he he was um, also w- r- rumored to be writing a book about the assassination of course Penn Jones who published my first work in the Continuing Inquiry as a very young guy he published the thing I wrote in the Continuing Inquiry. So I'll always hold a special place in my heart for him. But uh, you know, he he made a whole career out of you know covering these strange deaths, and he did you know maybe he went. He, I, I don't think all of them were what he claimed to be. He kind of got carried away with it, but he did some good work. And uh, I just resent it when I read some of the critics today. They they kind of discard a lot of these people, and they I've I've told them many times. You know you're you think you're gonna if you don't talk about the mysterious deaths if you don't talk. I mean Josiah Thompson's my favorite of that. This guy I read Six Seconds to Dallas. And he, I call these people neocons you know, or neo believers in conspiracy. And if you read those forums, they're completely run by neocons now. These are people that, uh, oh, there were no mysterious deaths. Uh, some of them think there were no Oswald impersonations when they're all over the place. Uh, the umbrella man, oh, it's nothing. It was Stephen Witt, this clown that came out of the woodwork for the House Select Committee on Assassinations and claimed he was there pumping an open umbrella in Dallas because he was protesting JFK's father appeasement policies in world war ii so i mean do you think any anybody could have if the, even if he did that that anybody in that crowd would have known what he was doing oh okay he's protesting jfk's dad's policies in world i mean it's absolutely ridiculous i mean maybe you carry a sign with you if you're doing that uh clearly ridiculous but the umbrella man was a very uh, shadowy figure the babushka lady who may or may not have been beverly oliver but you can see her in the film she was filming Gary Mack before he died. He used to email me all the time when he'd see my posts on the forums and correct me, you know, because he, he was, you know, he was doing work for the Sixth Floor Museum and he had gone over the dark side. He still pretended to kind of believe, but he, he was doing PR work for them. So he would see posts like mine and he, he says, well, you know, the Bewitchka lady, and he was the first one to, to say, well, she wasn't actually even filming. She was just taking a still picture. It's ridiculous. You can tell she she's, has a motion picture camera. And uh, it's, again, if there had been a real investigation, the, the, first of all, they would have wanted to see the Zapruder film and the Nick's film. And again, uh, Nick's daughter, Gail Nix Jackson, is still trying to get the, uh, the film, the, the uh, complete film from there. Because they, again, they, they edited that, they edited the Zapruder film. A real journalistic community and a real investigative community would have said, hey, these are really interesting witnesses. Who's that woman over there? We don't have her film. Find her. They never tried to. Who's, uh, you know, who's, who's this guy pumping an umbrella? And then all these other films, you see everybody else is milling around and him and this other guy, a uh, dark complected guy, whoever that guy is, they're just sitting calmly on the curb. I mean, I don't have to be a detective to know that's unusual behavior. And so you would question those people. Instead, they did nothing. I mean, you, would, you would, in a real investigation, you had people as it's come to light. It wasn't just Roger Craig. It was at least five other people that all described the same thing. And some of them didn't come up until the ARB days files being released that reported the same thing of someone looking like Lee Harvey Oswald running down the embankment outside the Texas School Book Depository minutes after the assassination and getting into a, a Rambler type automobile. They all described the same thing. If, if again, if I'm a detective, hey, that's a strong lead to go on. Nothing. They did nothing. Instead, they covered up. So we didn't even know there were that many people that had seen the same thing. And then they smeared Roger Craig and, you know, you know what happened to him. So uh, there's and I think that's what we need to concentrate on is what they did. So instead of giving credibility to people and realize people like Arlen Specter, you know, who invented the single bullet theory and was responsible for so much of this misinformation. He, he was horrible in the medical evidence. He was the one who, as Harold Weisberg pointed out, this is a guy who we don't know how much pressure footage that might have been contained information, the Warren Commission didn't want any of it. It's because Arlen Specter was in charge of the photographic evidence. You had, and Weisberg writes about this in his work, you had uh, local television stations contacted the commission say, hey, you know, we routinely uh, tape over these things and use the tape. Again, but we have, you know, if you want this, let us know, we'll send it to you. Never responded to them. They didn't want it. They didn't, so who knows what was on those tapes that were erased over. And, and that's, you know, it's that's inexcusable. And I don't think it can be easily explained. I don't think that's why people said there was a benign cover up. No, it was not benign because you don't you don't track down witnesses that uh, babysat an infant Oswald 
and and depose them as witnesses. That takes some work to know who even those people are. And yes, you don't call people like Admiral Berkeley, who should have been one of the first witnesses called. This is a guy who was a recipient of all the very dubious medical evidence. He was in the motorcade, but he wasn't where he normally was. You know, as Vince Palmer was pointed out, he usually was in the in the auto in the car with JFK. He wasn't, and uh, he was at Parkland Hospital. He again, he received all the medical evidence, and then he was at the very dubious autopsy in Bethesda. Wasn't called as a witness. So, I mean, how how do you how do you conduct an investigation like that? Lots of other uh, close witnesses, uh, people who weren't even identified, like the Babushka lady, like the Umbrella Man. These were close witnesses, even if they hadn't been doing what they did. So this is the problem is that they're there, but I don't think critics focus enough on that. And that's why I am painting with a broad brush. So I, I would say that the entire Warren Commission, I don't know if there was anybody on there that, that was trying to do good work. I think it was as corrupt to cover up as possible. And uh, the, it was they basically, you know, the FBI as NBC News signed the thing on, you know, we're not going to publish anything that isn't consonant with the FBI's ridiculous report. That basically the Warren Commission just was there to, to prop up and they filled out, put a lot of filler in with all these meaningless witnesses and they padded the testimony. They put all the exhibits, you know, with pubic hairs and all this crazy stuff just to make it look impressive when it was just a bunch of junk. I mean, and I know just have, you know, I just interviewed uh, one of my friends is Dean Anders III. It was uh, Dean Anders Jr., the New Orleans attorney that was played by John Candy in JFK. Very prominent, very interesting guy. Um, and uh, he's, we just had, we Got this. Got him on the record. My friend, but Fred Bob Wilson and I yesterday, so people can go see that uh, out there. If they uh, you look at my social media, they can find the links to that. But um, you know, the, the, the Dean what, Dean Andrews Jr. is one of the few testimonies. Wilma Tice, I mentioned, it's it's really just boring reading this stuff. Marguerite Oswald, Mark Lane, when he testified for the commission, there's only a handful of people where I actually read it and get anything out of it. The vast majority of you struggle to stay awake. Because they're not asking anything relevant. They're padding the record with questions about their background that's irrelevant. And it, you can look at look at what the, the, this is the basis for their investigation. And it's a complete joke. And the fact that anybody gives any credence to them or thinks that, that, that they were trying to do any kind of a job. I mean, this was, they were, they were told as, as uh, you know, as Wesley Liebler joked to Sylvia Odio when he was, uh, you know, propositioning her trying to get to sleep with her, you know, as she recounted, uh, he joked with her, you know, Oral Warren has told us that we have to lie to cover up the conspiracy. I mean, I mean that's, that's a kind of ridiculous thing to joke about, especially to a witness who uh, probably the best witness to an Oswald impersonator. But anyhow, that's the kind of uh, thing. And I, I know that I, a lot of the things I talk about, that's why I think you'll probably get something different from me than you would with most people, because a lot of them have forgotten these, these uh, original things that were unearthed by uh, citizen investigators. Uh, they don't give them the credit they deserve. And that's why I said things like, uh, whether it's JFK and the Unspeakable, which I, it is a good book, but I think it's a little overrated. I don't know what that much new stuff that came out of it. And the new things that come out again is Mark Lane had a saying for a long time. He said, you know, people always say, we're, we're, you know, where's the new evidence? I said, what's wrong with the old evidence? And I think you need to start there. You need to start with, because looking for these things, because that, that exonerates, it excuses people like the Warren Commission counsels, like the people like Nic Nicholas uh, Katzenbach, you know, as the assistant attorney general who wrote, the, again, the, the smoking gun memo, November 25th, to Bill Moyers, who's still alive. You know, one of LBJ's aides and later became a PBS star. You know, he's no journalist because he participated in this hard, huge cover-up. Anybody that reads that memo, is, is, I mean, Oswald had just been shot. His body was still warm. And this is the assistant attorney general of the United States is saying that we need to put something out to, let, to ensure that, that the public must be satisfied that Oswald was the assassin, that he had no Confederates at large. All questions about his motivation should be cut off. It's there. It's, I, it, people can go see it. It's, I published the whole thing in Hidden History. It's been published lots of other places. There's no innocent reason for that. There's no innocent explanation for it. And it tells you from the very beginning, Oswald, as you mentioned about Jack Ruby, you talk about a conspiratorial incident. Here you have a nightclub owner, mob connections, FBI informant, everything else. He comes in, shady characters you can find, comes in with 70 plus officers, supposedly protecting Lee Harvey Oswald, unnecessary transfer, announced to the press, 
He comes in, gets through all of them. Isn't nobody stops him. Jim Lavelle, who's handcuffed next to him, he lives to be 99. He gets a lot of mileage out of it. He, he supported the official story. They, uh, nobody tried to stop him. He shoots him in front of all these people. And you talk about a conspiratorial chestnut. And that didn't elicit the interest. And, and the assistant attorney general of the United States, right after it happens, is writing to LBJ's new top aide that, this is not, I mean, you should have said something. Hey, you know, we had to, have, we need to have a no holds barred investigation. Let's see what this guy Ruby's background is. Let's see their indications. And they had lots of indications that Ruby and Oswald knew each other. They had tons of people talking about Oswald being the carousel club. They knew that they knew each other because you had, um, you know, you had, uh, uh, I kept forgetting names all the time. The, one, the woman that, that died on the road, they talked about them being, uh, uh, bedmates that they were lovers so you had all, all these indications out there rose sherman rose sherman which i should know i interviewed her son several times uh but uh you know she was talking about she joked and she's also predicted the assassination before it happened she's in a hospital saying hey they're going to kill kennedy so these are all real things that happen the L, the the evidence of conspiracy is overwhelming it's everywhere the only question is exactly how big was it? And I think it was really, really big. And again, these people that try to minimize and say it was rogue agents, no, there was nothing rogue about it at all. Kennedy was, Kennedy was a huge thorn in the side of many powerful people. And I think, uh, you know, I think J the Oliver Stone got it probably right when he said, you know, there's something in the wind and all these powerful people kind of come together. So I think you had people, you know, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Pentagon, CIA uh, that had, all had you know reasons to want Kennedy dead and uh, to just try to toss it off. Eh, you know, it's probably mob elements working with rogue CIA. Just no, that's that's again, I don't know, but I just again, if you real investigation, I think would show you because it would show you could the mob could rogue CIA agents get every single journalist to lose their curiosity and and pass? Could they get NBC News to agree to? Yeah, we're just we're not going to question anything the FBI says. Could they get Dan Rather to lie about which, you know, which way uh, JFK's head was going on national TV when nobody had seen that film? So we don't know. He's had to take him at his word, right? They, could they get to the uh, Warren Commission who's, who are planning these witnesses to not call Admiral Berkeley, but find somebody who babysat Oswald and think that's a, you know, that's, that's a valuable witness? I mean, that, that's not benign and that's not small. That takes a lot of work to be able to even find people like that. So this was an absolutely huge conspiracy. And the fact that all these decades later, you still have people, you have somebody like Ben Shapiro, you know, the dar young darling guy on the right, right? He came out the other day with the, you know, you know, the brilliant, you know, brilliant, you know, uh, defense of, uh, of Oswald did it and smearing conspiracy theories. Again, this, why, what kind of conspiracy is that big that almost 60 years later, it can get somebody who wasn't anywhere close to being born at the time. What is he? You know, James Franco, the Hollywood actor that was a few years back in Huffington Post or something, wrote an article defending the Warren Report. What? I mean, who does that? Well, I mean, Michael Shermer, I've had him on my show before, but he wrote a book recently in 2022 about conspiracy and it talks about the Kennedy assassination. Now, when he told me on the show, it was about the idea that the president gets so many death threats a day, it's hard to take them all at face value. I go, yeah, but the Secret Service never I, I, I wish I would have known this back then, but I was like, the Secret Service destroyed the documents about death threats to Kennedy. So there's an idea out there that the, these multiple assassination attempts are conspiracy. And the reason that is, is because there's no document to back up whatever that claim is, even though we have many statements that'll say there was multiple attempts on his life. So, I mean, it's hard. It's like when I hear the skeptics talk sometime, I'm like, I feel like it's just that rebellious. I got to debunk this nonsense. And it's like, there's not nonsense though. You like, you can't question some of these things that get labeled conspiracy, which sucks. It feels like it should be the other way around calling it the Warren commission, a correct job is a conspiracy. Right. Well, I, I think, you know, again, you have both the, the right and Shapiro represents the right typical concern. The, the right typically hates Kennedy still. So they're not interested in his death. And, they, and, you know, they still continue, like with Clint Hill and everything, as Vince's point, Vince Pellarum's pointed out, they, get, they pretty much blame Kennedy for his death. You know, inaccurate, you know, dishonestly, he didn't keep them on, you know, he didn't keep them off the limousine, but they'll still tell you that. Yeah, you know, Kennedy was so reckless and everything. And they use that to smear all the Kennedys. And the left has always been horrible on the assassination because the left is so, 
so they don't like any conspiracy theories because most conspiracies are on the right. So they're just prejudiced against any conspiracy theories. So they, they don't want to be lumped in with anything else. And uh, so it's 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 terrible because everything should be taken at face value. And it's just it is what it is. What would you, you assume know? my political leanings would be? I, I don't know. From time you you haven't really said much. Ask me, but I, I know you're a guy, young guy. I don't know. Maybe you kind of independent. Smile. You, you, you kind of smiled when I said Ben Ben Shapiro. So I wouldn't say you were a conservative. But yeah, I, I I would think doing this, you're independent minded, and that's that's what most of us should be. You know, I don't I don't trust the the left or the right. And you know, people a lot of times think I'm far right because I I hate the woke left. But I you know I've always been a radical. Leftists or classical liberal populists. Huey Long's my hero. If we're being you know? honest, I think there's more of a deep state power. So I just think voting does nothing because there's real power somewhere else that you don't have. And people say like, oh, that's that's just crazy talk. I'm like, how is a guy who's elected for four years have more power than a person who's been on the Supreme Court until they die? It does not make any sense. Like people find out how to game the system. We know about insider trading and so much that goes on. And I'm, I don't even need to touch the Bohemian Grove crap. I can just tell you straight up about it's just common sense. Everything that gets done is this relationship of, between our government and big business. And business is war. Business is anything that can make them money. We know from – I mean I'm, we're not even going to talk about COVID, but – there's a whole lot of things you can look at and like, here's an example. Here's an example. And people are like, well, where's your evidence? Well, it's again, it, it, it's what we said earlier. You said that because because we've been lied to repeatedly, you end up with flat earth and hollow earth and simulated theory and no planes and empty buildings, and all that, because you can't get straight answers from any authoritative. The politicians are not are not going to tell you the truth. The media is not going to tell you the truth. The, the most of the uh, celebrity world's not going. I mean, they're, they maybe say the truth sometimes in wacky ways, you know, get Woody Harrelson types or something. But uh, but you're not going to get the truth from a anywhere. So people, and you're obviously your education. You're not going to learn the truth in school. If you talk about the, J the JFK assassination in school, it'll it'll gloss over it probably in less than a page, and they'll talk. It'll just say Lee Harvey Oswald killed him. That's it. So they're not going to give any. And so it uh, it's if you're being lied to repeatedly. Again, Mark Lane said, fertile grounds for speculation. You're going to develop these things. You talk about Bohemian Grove. You know, once Alex Jones snuck inside there and filmed that thing, they couldn't say what, that there wasn't a giant owl anymore. I don't know what it means, but it's pretty weird. And if you want to know Walter Cronkite, Walter Cronkite, the same guy that lied repeatedly, lied to his dying day. You know, he lived to be 90 some years old and he could never tell the truth. He presided over three or four horrible disinformation uh, specials on the Kennedy assassination for. Uh, for CBS, he, uh, you know, he was the voice of the owl for decades. Did you know that? He huh. played the voice of the owl. Yeah. So just, uh, and he also later joked about how he was proud to sit at the right hand of Satan in some stupid speech. So, uh, you know, again, <laughs> what does that mean? I don't know, but it's a pretty weird thing. It's a pretty weird thing to say. All right? the presidents have weird shit, man. You know, this, yes, they do. The stuff about Biden when showering with his daughters, and then yes, get, yeah. Look, just I look, mean, but look back. Linda Johnson walking around naked into the White House. Yes, or, you know, like yes, every yeah. the weird fraternity shit that goes on between these government officials. And and Bill Clinton, I mean, you know, he had how many women did he? And again, I talked about that in his Epstein. history. Epstein. You know, Epstein, but you you had Bill Clinton that had uh, at least two women accused him of forcible rape. One of them, Juanita Broderick, uh, NBC News, sat on that story. For a year because they didn't want to hurt his chances of re-election. Why do need to is still my friend on Facebook? Yeah, Ronald Reagan, people don't know. When he was a young man, he was accused of physical rape by a starlet. Nothing happened to him. And then George W. Bush was accused of raping a black woman. And she died suspiciously. And when I was writing about it for hidden history, I could I had to go to this obscure black newspaper in London. It's the only people that covered it. She'd been getting threats. She reported getting threats. How, how is that not a story? Didn't the press hate George W. Bush? And here he, he rapes and then apparently <laughs> has murdered a black woman? Nothing. No thing about it. So they, 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 the press covers up everything. Joe Scarborough, you know, with a young intern that was found dead with a head wound in his office when he was a congressman. Try to get some information on that. Tar Reid? No, uh, well, Tar Reid, yes. Tar Reid, where did she go? You heard it. I, I, I tried to get her for my show. I'd love to talk to people like that. It's these things. There's so many cover ups. And that's why people say it all the time. Well, you think everything's a conspiracy. And I said, well, yes, I do. 
because we're being, I think we're being run by conspirators. These people don't know any other way of doing things. It's a conspiracy. It's, they're in a conspiracy. They're conspiring against the public interest. That's what they do. That's the way they conduct business. They don't know any other way. And uh, as Jim Forrestal, the, the first secretary of defense under Truman said, before they pushed him out of a window at Bethesda Naval Hospital, claim he jumped. Uh, he, he, There's uh, a lot of he, that in history. There's yeah, a lot. Frank yes, Olson's he, a good example. Yes, Frank Olson's one too. But, he, but Forrestal had this great line where he said, you know, if, if this wasn't a huge conspiracy, once in a while, they'd make a mistake in our favor. And I use that line all the time. You know, if this was random, once in a while, something good would happen. Some president would emerge. I mean, kind of like JFK. I mean, okay, that was a, a random blip. They killed him. But they would emerge and say, you know, God, we, gotta, you know, we really, the, the average people are really getting screwed over. You know, they're the ones that need a break. You know, we keep asking them to sacrifice. You know, this, this thing is rigged against the average worker. People are being paid too little. You never hear anything like that. Or, you know, we really do have to upgrade this infrastructure. This is embarrassing, you know, how, how bad the roads and bridges and power grids are. You never hear that. They'll, they'll pay lip service to it, but none of it gets done. But they always can find, uh, they can't find money for anything like that. But whenever, uh, you know, you need to bomb some country for no reason at all, nobody asks how you're going to pay for that. It just gets done. You know, so of course, we always have money for that. But I don't know. I'm kind of all over the place. But that's, and anyhow, that's... Um, Mr. Jeffries, I'm probably going to be. <laughs> you're you're epic to talk to, man. I appreciate the time you gave me to chat, man. You've given me enough. Um, I really do appreciate every minute uh, that you gave me today. Uh, is there a place where people can find your links? I want to make sure people can find your books as well, too. Yeah, DonaldJeffries.media is my website, and uh, I also write it down at Substack DonaldJeffries.substack.com. I have a good following over there. My books are everywhere on my show. I protest live streams every Friday on rockfin.com from five to seven Eastern. Uh, I have lots of good guests there and uh, people can uh, catch me lots of places. And uh, the Donald Jeffries media is the, the best place. All right. Well, I appreciate you for doing the podcast. Thanks everybody for listening to this episode. Out of the blank.